What's up, fellas? Good to see you guys again for another rendition of the Blind Pig, courtesy of BGObsession.com. Happy to see you. Uh, quick intros. Top left is John. He hails as Boone. Top right is Bob. He hails as Neophyte. Bottom left is Chris. He hails as Chris. And bottom right is Paul. He hails as the old Canadian hog. Uh, and you can find me. My name's Derek. I hail as Silent Threat. So please come on by. Mix it up. Read some of the content. Uh, before we kick things off, John, I know you're, uh, you've are you got an ulterior motive going on that you launched in the last 24 hours or so. Do you want to say something real quick about that? Yeah, I won't take too long. I just wanted to mention, you know, we try to do some site charity stuff now and, and again. And uh, a good friend of mine at work let me know a couple months ago that she and her husband were going to take in a refugee family from Ukraine. And it turns out that basically this gentleman, Mark, um, who was living in Zaporizhia, Ukraine, which is near a bunch of nuclear power plants. Uh, he and his two daughters, who were like 10 years old and seven years old, uh, they basically got forcibly removed from their home, all of their possessions, including their vehicle, stolen from them. And then they were kind of out roaming the countryside. And so this poor father, Mark, uh, shuttled his daughters across the country, basically going sleeping in cars, sleeping in train stations, uh, you know, going to churches, looking for food for his kids and himself with literally like nothing on their on their nothing but the clothes on their back, uh, which he, I can't even imagine what that must have been like, especially, you know, where I think most of us are dads, you know, um, the kind of pressure that he was under. But anyway, they eventually got to were able to make their way to Germany and they connected with some kind of U.S. humanitarian group and through some program called the Uniting for Ukraine, they were able to link up with my friend in the United States and and travel to the United States illegally. Um, they speak only Russian. They have nothing. Um, and so we decided to start a GoFundMe uh, program. Mark, the father, is a carpenter. Um, he's looking for work. But you can imagine he doesn't speak English, doesn't have any money, doesn't have transportation. So all three of them are trying to learn English. The girls are in school, but they need a lot of help. So uh, we started a GoFundMe a campaign on behalf of BGO. And we're trying to raise funds for uh, for Mark, Alina, and Anna. If you'd like to be a part of it, um, you can go to GoFundMe. I'm not going to try to read you the URL, but if you'll just search my name, which is John, J-O-H-N, last name Jeffries, J-E-F-F-R-I-E-S, you'll see a, a campaign called Help Our Ukrainian Family. And um, whether you support us financially or sharing our link, uh, either way, it would be greatly appreciated. And of course, the one nice thing about this kind of charity is, you know, every cent of except for what uh, GoFundMe pulls out at the, you know, at the end for administrative charges, all of that money goes to them directly to them. And uh, when when I do give them the money, I, I I made a personal contribution to them. And you would have thought that I like bought him a house. They were so uh, he was so grateful. I got like a translated text from him because that's really the only way he can communicate. But anyway, we're trying to help him out. Um, we're doing pretty well so far. We have a goal of like five grand. We're over a thousand already. So, we, but we really need some help. A lot of times with these kind of things, you get a bunch, you get a flush of contributions and then it's like cricket chirps <laughs> after that. So we're going to try to keep, keep it out there on social media, but any help anyone can give us, we'd appreciate it. And thank you guys for your support. Also. If, if searching GoFundMe is, is too much, there's a link on bgobsession.com in the five o'clock, uh, in the five o'clock club forum. So yep. you can go directly. If you go to bgobsession.com, hit the five o'clock club forum and hit the link. Or you can follow us on Twitter or Facebook where we mm -hmm. have groups and we will spam the ever loving hell out of you with it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, after the administrative duties are uh, complete, uh, I guess we try, uh, this is a little different. Normally we wait till Wednesday, but we figured we would jump on a Monday night because some uh, some big time news went down this past week. I believe the news actually broke on Thursday. Is that right? Thursday was the day that things got hot and heavy. I think the team made it official Friday. But despite John's greatest efforts to thwart our ability to have hope that we could have him as our offensive coordinator, because he said there was no chance that guy would ever come here, the team landed Eric B. Enemy. So not to not to bash you, John. A lot of people didn't believe that actually. Um, and myself included, I thought it would be a good move for him. I just didn't think it would happen because I didn't think with the, uh, the upcoming off season with a potential ownership change, the 
almost guarantee that after 20 after 12 months you're going to be either looking for a job or at least worried about what's going to happen next um i i didn't think it would be enough to lure somebody serious i think most of us believed it would be Shermer or Zampezi when we were talking a couple weeks ago but the enemy is the new oc so i'd uh, like to hear how you guys want to react to that the interesting thing to me is, you know, we spent the two months prior to this, like hearing Rivera and um, and Mayhew talk about how they wanted to pound it, rush oriented offense. You know, we talked before about like the two to one <laughs> rush to pass ratio, and then they go out and they find the OC of the so most West Coast passing attack West Coast zone run offense in the league. So that was part of my skepticism. It just didn't line up with what they had said, but I'm starting to think that that was, that was not really um, that maybe that wasn't as really set in stone as what we think. Cause there's no way, there's no way that the enemy is going to, we're not going to have a rush dominant, dominant attack. I can't imagine, but that was, that was my first thought was I was surprised that he would be the guy for that reason. I was, I was surprised just because this is Washington and we can't have nice things. Um, you know, I, I mean, we just we just can't, right? And 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 I I understand that I'm jaded after 30 years. Uh, you know, I get it. It's no been, way. Like, 32 years since the last Super Bowl appearance, so I'm a little, I'm a little, you know, I don't know. But I, I also, and I I I I think everybody recognizes, I was the voice that kept saying, I, I totally see why he would want to come here, even under the circumstances. I, I felt like there was a possibility simply from the standpoint of look at all the shiny toys he's going to have to play with in Washington. Um, I, and I, I think everybody recognizes that we've got to put some serious investment into the offensive line. We've got a young quarterback that's that everybody, I say everybody, the fans, and it seems like people within the team are, are, are excited about. Um, we don't completely know what we've got. I don't want to put too much pressure on Mr. Howell yet, but you know, it just he he looked he looked decent. He looked good. He I I, I love the arm. And you listen to the quarterbacks talk about him, and they're excited about playing with Sam Howell, which you know does nothing to dampen my excitement about things. You know, we get a real offensive line, and I think the enemy probably recognizes that he's got the opportunity to put up some big numbers with this offense if he can coach Sam Howell up, and he's got a history you know, with, uh, you know, the podcast right after the end of the season, I read off Pat Mahomes numbers from his rookie season. They're not all that different from Sam Howell's numbers. One game, he had one interception. He had no touchdowns. He had more yards, but they throw the ball more in Kansas city than we do in Washington right now. Uh, so, uh, you know, I totally saw the, 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 the possible allure. If he can come here and make this happen and make something stick he won't just be the hottest commodity next year. He'll be the only commodity that people want next year because let's face it, it, you know, you know what they say about New York, right? If you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. Well, in the NFL world, if you can make it in Washington, in Burgundy and gold, by God, you can play football anywhere because this place has got to be the hardest team in the world outside of maybe the Jets to do anything with. So I, I personally um, like the move. Um, obviously, I think it is a step in the right direction. When you think of where Washington has struggled mightily uh, on offense over the years, it's red zone efficiency, it's third down efficiency, it's the ability to generate uh, over 20 points. We've struggled in all three of those areas. And when you look at what Eric Bieniemy has been able to do with Kansas City since I believe 2018, um, they are pretty much at or very near the top of the league in those areas. Uh, they they have scored over 25 points 60 times since his arrival. Uh, they are a top three team in the NFL since Bieniemy was in Kansas City at third down efficiency, and same thing with red zone efficiency. I mean, they are pretty much the cream of the crop. Uh, when it comes to those areas and those have typically been uh, huge huge struggles for us even if you think back to last season um, had we been more efficient in the red zone uh, you could have been looking at a team that 
you know, had another two or three wins potentially on the season. Um, so he's obviously going to address um, some of our downfalls uh, and some of our major, major weaknesses. And I think that that is um, a very promising for us moving forward. But again, at the end of the day, it's Washington and I'm trying not to get excited about this at the same time, just trying to be reserved about it because we have seen countless guys come in here that we thought were the answer that we hoped were the answer. And it has always come crumbling down uh, to a screeching halt. So we'll see, but uh, definitely a step in the right direction. I was surprised <clears throat> that they were able to get it done. I'm also excited <laughs> that they were able to get it done. Um, I don't want to throw out a lot of things like Sam uh, slam dunk, home run, et cetera, et cetera. But if I'm Ron Marrera, <clears throat> that's a huge move for me. I mean, my head's on the chopping block. I basically have, I have two years left on my contract, but I have one year left to make a difference. Um, Scott Turner, who I, on the board, I put up what his resume was before he came here as offensive coordinator. I don't see anything on that resume that says he deserved to be the offensive coordinator for the last several years. <laughs> so I think that's a huge thing. Um, I saw someone say today that they hope that Rivera and Vienna are on the same page. <laughs> I hope that Rivera's page is a read only. Yeah, I don't, I don't <laughs> hope that at all. I hope yeah. Rivera, I'm with you. I don't want Rivera no, saying a damn thing about the offense. I don't want, I want him to have no editing ability on the page. He can Amen. read it all he wants, but you know, that's the extent of it. Uh, I think for Eric bien it's a slam dunk and a home run. Obviously, the man wants to be a head coach <clears throat> for some reasons that have all been debated endlessly. He's interviewed 16 times with 15 teams and not had the opportunity. Looming over him the whole time for the last five years is Andy Reid's shadow and Patrick Mahomes' shadow. <clears throat> what does he do? I've never really gotten an answer to that. Um, found out a little bit more this week about game planning and deep diving and things like that, but he doesn't call plays. He might call them occasionally, but he's not the play caller. This is Eric Bianami's chance to show what Eric Bianami is capable of. So for a guy that wants to be a home run, <clears throat> I mean, who wants to be a head coach, I'm sorry, um, to be able to come here uh, with both the skill position advantages that we do have and if we can fix the offensive line, to be able to put his mark on something that's going to be noticeable, very noticeable, if they're top half of the league or better, um, I think it sets him up to get back in the conversation. Because these days in the NFL, it seems to be, we want the, the newest, latest, greatest guy, <clears throat> and we're going to give them the opportunity, like the two Philadelphia coordinators who both got head coaching jobs uh, coming off the Super Bowl loss. I think once your name's been out there a few times and a few years go by, I think you drop off the list. And I don't think that um, you're given serious consideration anymore. So for whatever reason, he didn't get it before. He's got a chance now to put his stamp on something and say, it's me. It's not Andy Reid. Let's go. As far as the expectations, man, that the bar has got to be pretty low, right? I mean, in terms of him being a success, Scott Turner, I mean, it it was pretty ugly. And, I mean, I feel like he was made a scapegoat to an extent because of the quarterback situation and the O-line. and But but he he earned his exit, right? Out. He earned it. He worked hard for it, and he got it. Um, but I feel like if they can finish in the top – I think on the board we've got a, a thread, um, Commander's Coffee, for this week to ask kind of what would constitute success – and to me, it's like just like what you said, Chris, top top half of the league offense this year and maybe top 10 the following year. And they'll I mean, he'll <laughs> he'll walk into a head coaching vacancy um, if he does that in Washington. Or he won't. So, everybody will laugh and say, Haha, see, we told you that's why he wasn't uh, ever seriously considered for a head coach. Position. Well, to that to that point. <clears throat> To that point, it's almost built in that if he struggles here, everybody's going to look at that and say, man, the enemy is just the latest coach in a long line of coaches that have come here and they have not been able to escape the swamp. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's it's the reverse car wash. Guys come in here clean and they leave dirty. It just kind of happens that way. Um, this is a my, biggest, my biggest fear. I'm sorry, Derek. My biggest fear is that 
I don't want people to think he's not coming in as the head coach. He can't change everything. He can yeah. change his side of the ball. Um, and, you know, from a expectation standpoint, and that's all we want from him, and that's all that anybody's going to expect from him. So, kind kind put this out today and said this was sort of stunning, but then again, not surprising. Washington has averaged twenty or more points per game five times since the year two thousand. Twenty points, three touchdowns a game average five times, so less than twenty twenty five percent of the time. That's for a season, right? Not a very season. good. <laughs> One of those years was RG 3s rookie year. I'm yeah. sure. Twelve, yeah. And One of them was, was probably 05. Was that RG3 the Brunel run? Kyle Shanahan. <laughs> As old Flubber so, said, not very good. To go with the, to go a little further, they're 28th in points per game since 2000. So only four teams have had a lower points per game average in the last 23 years. They've averaged That's fewer than 18 Lions. points per game 12 times. 12 seasons we've averaged less than 18 points a game. So the enemy can walk in here, and if he can inject five points per game into this offense, I'm not even saying a full touchdown, five on average, which we all saw the offense this past year. It's there, okay? The, we have the skill position players to make it happen. Five points per game, I believe, brings them to middle of the pack. And you can bet that this is a double digit in this this season. This past season, we probably are a double digit win team and we're sniffing around at a legitimate playoff contention. I'm not gonna say Super Bowl, but playoff. I think I think if we're averaging five more points per game, we go into the playoffs feeling pretty confident with that defense. Um so I think he's walking into a situation he has 100% the ability to take a team that is ready to perform and make them perform. So, um, so, so one thing, I, I all the talk on – and the hype train, man, on social media, I haven't seen it – I haven't seen it that crazy since maybe mm -hmm. Chase Young pick, you know, uh, and maybe not even that. Um, it's been crazy – what people have been saying on social media, but all the conversation about why would he want to come here? I, I think he must really like Sam Howell, unless there's some grand plan in the background that we don't know about. He has to really like Sam Howell because it's a big risk coming here. And especially after Rivera has more or less said it's Howell's job to lose. And we're not going to go after any of the big time free agents to the extent there are big time free agents. He's got to see something in Hal that he thinks is special to come here, I think. I just get that feeling. It's I, hard I, to argue. Uh, I mean, okay. even if even if Rivera – I mean, he would be kind of dumb to go into it with Rivera saying, yeah, we're going to address the quarterback position. You know what I mean? Like, that doesn't mean squat. So, I, I agree. He's got to see something in Hal that – to to make – to lead him believe, to believe he can be successful here at least. It's not a Jason Campbell, excuse me, it's not a Dwayne Haskins situation, right? Where, okay, they drafted him, so, you know, the owner drafted him. So I'm, I'm going to have to play him for a while. It's definitely, I don't think that's kind of situation. No, I don't think that happens outside the first round, John. I mean, we burned, we burned draft capital to get our hands on Dwayne Haskins. The, you know, the guy we wanted was apparently Sweat. We had to trade to get back into the first round to get Sweat after we burned our own pick on on Haskins so we you know we spent a lot of draft capital that year to get the players we we I'll put that in quotes because who knows who we really is right wanted Sam Howell's a fifth round draft pick fifth round draft picks come and go in the NFL all the time you know you go back and look at our draft history granted for the last three years, we've drafted really well. But you go back and look at our draft history before that, and there aren't a lot of fifth-round picks left in the league from our drafts prior to that, prior to, to Ron Rivera and, and crew coming to town. So I don't – yeah, I think you're right. I think he's got to look at Sam Howell and see something he feels like he can work with. And, and I don't want to go so far as to say he thinks he can make Howell into something special. 
But I think he looks at the weapons he's got and what Howell can do, and he thinks, you know what? This offense can can move the football. Maybe not quite like Pat Mahomes and Travis Kelsey, because let's face it, there's only one of each of those guys in the NFL. Uh, and, and, and we certainly don't have a Travis Kelsey wannabe uh, in the tight end pool at the moment. But Howell's got to look really good at this point in time. And all of the weapons that he's got and how free everybody's running in the secondary every play. If He's got to figure, you know, if I can coach this kid to find the open guy, we're going to move the football because the receivers are getting open. Well, to yeah. take it a step further, he's probably looking at this offense and saying, I would do this and this, and it's effective from day one. You know, we have been talking about fixing the O-line but how many times did we look back in the games last year and we have John Bates lined up one-on-one -on -one against Joey Bosa or how many times after, after Kayvon Thibodeau destroyed Cosme for three consecutive series, we didn't make an adjustment. I mean, you wonder how much of that is the enemy looking at that and saying, well, on this play, all I need to do is motion the tight end over and chip this. And now Terry McLaurin walks in for a touchdown on the other side of the field. So I'm sure he's done his homework on stuff like that. So maybe maybe the wholesale changes on the O-line aren't specific to player, but there's a schematic adjustment to that that helps give them the help, that, that, that helps give them that additional blocker that doesn't leave Leno on an island to get, you know, abused play after play and give up these sacks that everybody makes it look like our line is garbage. And, and Derek, you, you use the word adjustment and it just sparked an idea in my mind of something that I wanted to uh, bring up in regards to Eric the enemy this evening. Um, as far as I can tell, he looks and seems pretty promising in the adjustment category. Um, when you think of our team, we have really, really struggled in terms of being able to uh, respond to what other teams have been throwing our way and just basically being out coached and not being able to be able to make the necessary in-game adjustments to win. When you look at the enemy's resume on the biggest of stages uh, in both Super Bowls that Kansas City won, they were trailing fairly significantly in both of those games to San Francisco and Philadelphia. And I mean, look at that Philadelphia game. He comes out in the second half and he just basically puts on a masterclass in terms of being able to make adjustments and uh, figure things out and allow his team to be successful. So um, again, another serious area of need for our team and certainly something that I think is one of his strengths. One thing, I found, one thing I found interesting um, that maybe ties in with the Sam Howell part of the story with the enemy is that if you compare Sam Howell's college career with Patrick Mahomes' college career, and I'm not saying Sam Howell is Patrick Mahomes or will ever be Patrick Mahomes, but statistically through that period of their life, they're almost identical. And the rookie years are pretty darn close, too. I mean, the, the one game at the end of the year, almost identical as well. Yep. Hey, it, all right. So I just got I was curious about something, something somebody said about the Super Bowl and adjustments and whatnot. So I, I just pulled up the box score. Has anybody stopped and looked at the run pass ratio for Kansas City in the Super Bowl? It's pretty close to uh Two to one. About an even split. 26 rushes, 27 mm -hmm. passes. Mm -hmm. And they're doing it on the they, on the heels of Isaiah Pacheco. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We aren't talking about we aren't talking about a, you know an Antonio Gibson or Brian Robinson here. Although I gotta admit, I was pretty impressed with Pacheco in the Super Bowl. I, I like Pacheco. <laughs> I, I did. I like that kid. I mean, they throw 60% of the time. They've done that like the last three seasons pretty much across the board. So, And that's that's only a little bit more than the NFL average. So I don't think there's – I don't yeah, know. I, 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 but my, my, my question here is how much of that is Andy Reid? How much of that is, is, is 
Eric Bieniemy. I saw yeah. somebody. How much of any of it is Andy? Nobody is knows. Yeah. Nobody. I'm trying to remember. Somebody on the board posted a an article. It might have been you, Chris. I don't remember. Somebody posted an article about what we can expect from Eric Bieniemy, and they did a breakdown of all the the article did a breakdown of all the guys that have left the Andy Reid coaching tree, left, you know, been hired as head coaches someplace else or offensive coordinators someplace else and run their offense. And it's fairly amazing how much more these guys tend to run the ball in a lot of instances when they leave Andy and, and get their own, you know, get their own house to put in order, so to speak. Almost all of them run the ball more than Reed does. Yeah, uh, so, the enemy said, um, <clears throat> I believe I'll paraphrase it, but something along the lines of you throw the ball to score, you run the ball to win. And I think that meant, you know, you get up, get the score up in the second half, you just run the ball, run the clock out, and do it. You can do both, and there's different times to do both. I wanted to ask you guys something, and I asked this on the board. And nobody replied at all, which uh, that could mean I'm boring, but I think it's it's we're all we're all a bunch of white guys right on this podcast, uh, at least tonight. Do you got what do you think of the fact that this is an African-American up and coming coach getting his first big chance? I mean, it, to all intents and purposes, his first big chance. I'm just wondering how that what the players, how that feels to them and whether that and I, I'm not trying to make a big thing about it. I just wonder if it's easier for an African-American offensive coordinator, who's, I bet you he's not going to be up in the booth. I bet you anything he's going to be on the sidelines. I, I just get that feeling that he's a fire, a fire and brimstone kind of guy, and he's not going to want to be up in a booth, but we'll see. Um, but I just wonder what you guys thought about that, whether that's a big deal to the players who are mostly African-American, whether they'll be able to relate to him better. Um, I don't know. I never heard any of the players say anything one way or the other about Scott Turner but I don't think he was a fire and brimstone motivational. I don't think anyone was ever inspired by Scott Turner on that roster. You know, there was some late season leaks out of the locker room that made it sound like Scott Turner didn't exactly have the most incredible relationship with the players. Like I maybe think... he was difficult to, he had a difficult time translating his ideas to the players. And, and, and oftentimes meetings were more complicated than they needed to be. I, you know, I, it, that, that's just kind of what it sounded like to me. I don't, I would like to think that it has nothing to do with race, but John, you may have, I mean, you may have a point. I don't know. These guys seem excited. The few that I've seen comments from, they seem excited about this. Now Players the question are. is, are they excited because, you know, the enemies kind of, well, not kind of, kind of the enemies, this, you know, of a like race with with the guys that have commented so far because all the guys that have commented so far have been african-american that i've seen and or are they excited because this is a guy that's been playing with the most high-flying mm -hmm. offense in the nfl for the last four or five years and they see that coming to dc i'm a hundred percent raising that question as a positive but by the way i just think sure. i guess the word i would be looking for is like is he going to be more relatable to them? Even if he's chewing their ass because they didn't do what they were supposed to do on a given play, are they going to buy in more? And is he going to be have more of a relationship with them? I don't know. I'm just I just thought it was an interesting sidebar. No. I think I think athletes want to win, and uh, a lot of the other stuff can. It doesn't matter if you win, if you're successful. The one I thing I did, the one thing I did see a couple Logan Paulson, John Kime. Both on multiple occasions have said that um, Scott presence uh, Scott Turner really had no presence on the practice field. He didn't really know he was out there. He was out there, but there was nothing noticeable. Kaim had a pod today, I believe it was with the ESPN Insider for the Chiefs, who's been with that team for at least as long as kaim has been covering the Reds, the Washington team. Um, and he said, "John, you're going to hear his voice." You're going to know he's out there. You're going to get tired of hearing his voice. Um, he's demonstrative. He's demanding. Uh, he will stop plays if someone puts the wrong foot in front of the other or all these kind of, he went into a lot of detail about how detailed the enemy is in his job. Um, and I think those things are going to matter much more and the results 
and improved execution and improved results are going to matter much more than the color of his skin. And that's that's the kind of thing that I, I think we've been missing here since Gibbs, too, if you really want to know the truth. I, I don't think Greg Williams, Williams probably. Well, I, I'm talking about on offense, but yeah, Greg Williams, Greg Williams would be the defensive equivalent. Although my guess is Jack Del Rio probably shuts things down if somebody's got a foot in the wrong place and a hand in the wrong place and not doing what he wants done. I, I've had my problems with Del Rio, but I don't think he is a he's a lackadaisical coach. I think he's fairly demanding. But on on the offensive side of the ball, my guess is we haven't had the enemy's level of discipline and detail since Gibbs and Al Saunders left him. Well, and accountability. You know, I, I, all we heard about Jay Gruden was how practices were really lax and guys would screw plays up. And instead of running the play again, they just moved on to the next play. We heard that for five years. And I don't think you're going to hear that with Eric the enemy. I, I granted, I don't know what our practices have been like for three years under Ron Rivera. Um, but that kind of is its own indictment of Scott Turner, isn't it? We don't know. I think they're going to be different. Um, well, but... we know that we know that it's taken half of every season for the team to look like they were ready to play NFL football, and mm -hmm. I can't help but think that that's a reflection of practice and what's going on in team rooms but um i don't know to um just to get back to the original question and kind of touch back chris the other thing beyond winning that they care about is they want to get paid uh you know there's a very large sector of the nfl players and the of the players that i'm not going to say they don't care about winning but that that in their heart of hearts, the results of the team are secondary to their financial status. Uh, we're going to be look, staring down the barrel of that gun here in the next couple of days when it comes to Deron Payne. Uh, I don't think Deron Payne lost any sleep based on the fact that we missed the playoffs. Okay. I think he absolutely went out, it came out of this season believing it was a success because of how he set himself up to get paid in the off season. Um, so I think I think that there are a, there's a segment of the league that feels the same way, and if Eric Bieniemy can get them paid, then they're gonna they're gonna see that as motivation, just like anybody else in a job. There's five people on this phone call, and all five of us can be motivated by financial status, you know. Um, professional loyalty, I don't think. Is is it's definitely not as strong within the locker room as it is with the fan base. Um, so I think there's a lot of guys that are excited that he's coming in here because, and I'm not saying Curtis Samuel feels this way because I don't know Curtis Samuel. I've never had a conversation with him, but I can guarantee you he's looking at Eric Bannemi and saying, "All right, we're going to eat now." Okay, um, he's looking at it like I was over there running off tackle between in through the through the B gap getting my head blown off by a 250 pound linebacker. And then I'm watching, I'm watching what McCole Hardman and, T and, and, and Tyreek Hill and Pacheco and McKinnon and these playmakers are doing when they get the ball in their hands and their ability to create space. So I, I think, I think a lot of the guys are, are aren't just excited because of pedigree, but because of what it's going to mean for them individually. You know, so I'm, I'm, and if that that's what it takes to be successful, then that's what it takes to be successful. Uh, but as far as relating, he's a former running back. He was a running back in the NFL. Uh, he was a running back at Colorado. He went back to Colorado and was the offensive coordinator before he Star went. Star running back at Colorado. I mean, before he went back to um, Kansas City to become the running uh, to be the running backs coach there. So I think seeing that. He's going to be able to instantly get credibility from some of the guys in the locker room because not only has he done it, he's done it successfully. Something that Scott Turner's never done. Okay. Scott Turner's never been an NFL quarterback. He played quarterback in high school. I don't know where he, if he did in college. Um, I don't think Jay Gruden was, a, was, an, was ever played anything in the NFL. Um, 
so if we're talking about offensive minds coming in beyond just the color of his skin, I think he, he, he instantly has that credibility because he's, he's a former player and maybe he is more relatable because he's a peer as much as he's, you know, a peer on the, as far as, as in the NFL brotherhood, as much as the, his heritage and his culture. So, Paul, one one thing I wanted to ask you guys, and maybe we'll start to find out on Thursday at the press conference, but how much how much autonomy is he going to have? Do you guys think? Do you really believe? Like it, and it, do you think he has carte blanche on what coaches he gets to keep, what quarterback to play, those kinds of things? I I, I would personally hope that he gets a hundred percent autonomy to do whatever. Uh, he feels is necessary to help this offense move forward. I mean, we have been completely swirling the drain offensively for years, and it is essentially our Achilles heel. Uh, When you come in here with the pedigree that he has uh, in Kansas City and the work that he's been able to do there, and granted, we know there's that debate of, well, how much of it it is actually him and how much of it is Andy Reid, but you know he has – uh, you, you know, he has some sort of effect on that as well. When you got a guy like Patrick Mahomes in his post game interview, uh, immediately following the Super Bowl, uh, basically saying that every team needs an Eric the enemy on it, I think there's you, you need to put a lot of stock into that. So, given the guy's pedigree, I would hope that he would be able to come in here and uh, be able to do whatever he feels is necessary to be successful. And let's face it, Ron Rivera is, um, on his he, he's basically standing on his last leg right now as well and he's in desperation mode um so if you're in desperation mode and i'm looking around the league to see who should i have faith in who can i depend on to help move this team forward i think the enemy would be as uh, good an option as any so i would hope the guy would have complete autonomy coming in here you know i i Along those lines, I find it intriguing. Apparently, Biennemi had dinner with team officials Wednesday night. The interview went all day Thursday. And then they got back together again Friday morning and talked some more. Maybe I've no, I've got those I've got those th- those dates right because he because the parade in Kansas City was Wednesday. So I mean, when was the last time any of us heard of a prospective Washington coach being interviewed for what amounts to almost two full business days. For a coordinator. Isn't it? Probably. Isn't it? Probably. Give an interesting spin on it. Business. What, what's that, Chris? Let me give you an interesting spin on it. Okay. There are those out there, and I've seen a few reports that the believe that believe it was the enemy interviewing the commanders not the commanders interviewing again. Wouldn't surprise me. Wouldn't I think that makes a lot of sense, but he's taking a huge risk, man. He's got a, he's, you know, he wants to know every detail of how he, I guarantee you, he probably asked the question. When I, I, he was going want, interviewing. Yes. When yeah. I don't want this staff member, what's the answer going to be? Or when I don't, you know, I mean, I'm well, sure. Rightfully so. I think that, oh, look, I'm not going to go on some societal change here, but I, I, honestly, that should be any job interview. The person who's sitting on the, on, you know, on the hired side of the table should be interviewing the opposite side as much as the other direction. You got to want to make sure you want to be there. Yeah. And I hope the enemy was. And my, it honestly, to your point, I'm now, I, now we're seeing reports. I saw a couple little scuttlebutt reports and take it for what it's worth that, that the, the job was offered at dinner on when, on Wednesday, Thursday and Friday was him hammering out staffing and salary and yep. some other things uh it it was not it was not working out the details of of whether or not they were interested in each other or some sort of convincing that was probably the enemy being at the facility going line by line with that offensive staff going line by line with what's expected in the draft and in the free agency and saying what are we going to do because the second I put my name on this, I lose my leverage. I have all the leverage right now. I can tell you what to do right now. As soon as I sign that contract, I I, I can't do that anymore. So I need assurances about where this the, the direction of this offense before well, I'm willing to give up that that leverage. 
take it a step further, Derek, it's I have the leverage now. I want to leverage these things right into my contract. I want right. legal grounds to stand on. I want I want section four, paragraph three to say Eric B. Enemy has exclusive control over the, the offensive staff or has exclusive control, you know, I, whatever the wording actually was, right? Because I'll be honest with you, uh, if I'm Ron Rivera, I'm not sure I'm going to give him a hundred percent control of staff on the offensive side of the ball. I have never seen that in the business world. I have never seen a manager given a hundred percent staff control outside of their director. And every time I interview for a job, if it progresses past the hiring manager, I have to interview with the director or the VP or whoever the next step up the ladder is. And, and they always have to sign off on it. Um, you know, I mean, I've seen plenty of people get to the point where they had a job interview with the next guy up or two guys up and not come out of that with a job offer. Everybody else loved them. The top guy went, eh, I don't like this. Now, how often is Ron going to exercise that? Probably not very often if he's smart. But if I'm the head coach, I'm not ceding 100% control over that. What did yeah, you I mean, guys? I don't ahead. even know who he wants to keep. So I mean, he may want to keep some, but I got to guess if he, if he stands on the table and says, "I want uh, X individual to be my quarterbacks coach," mm -hmm. I'm guessing he's getting that guy to be his quarterback coach. Un un unless unless there's some kind of overriding reason that Ron has a character issue deep in the yeah. guy's background or something, you yeah. know that. But I mean there's been a lot of speculation in the last couple of weeks that the enemy isn't the head coach because of character issues in his background. 20 years. Deep, doesn't I have a, <laughs> yeah. I have a, well, I have a real issue with, you know, 20 years deep guys should, guys should have an opportunity to prove that they've changed. Guys should have an opportunity to move on from that kind of crap. You know, we were all young ones, right? Thank God the internet wasn't a thing when I was, you know, 18 to 25 years of age. Um, but I wonder if there's any, uh, you know, there was leaks out that uh, they were very, that he interviewed very well. I wonder if that was intentionally leaked out because of, you know, the the common thought that he hasn't been become a head coach because he doesn't interview well. I don't know. Right. I think I mean, it's stuff. the alternative, it's the acceptable alternative explanation to uh, mm -hmm. endemic racism amongst <laughs> the, the NFL ownership oh, rank, right? I mean, no. so you're right. I'm not surprised they're pushing that narrative. See, and I, I, all right, I realize I'm going to come off like the old, like the, you know, the, the old defensive white guy. I have a real hard time with that concept. There have been plenty of men of color hired in the, I say plenty, not probably not plenty, but there have been several hired in the last two or three years for jobs the enemy interviewed for or was considered for. And so I, I were some of his interviews over the last five years to fill the Rooney role? Yeah, probably. You know, let's face it, the NFL's got its rules and, you know, they also have a good old boys club and you're much more likely to get hired for a job where you know somebody or somebody knows you and maybe the enemy didn't interview with anybody that knew him and they needed an excuse. But the flip side of that coin is if I'm Eric the enemy and I am hearing year after year, he didn't interview well. And I'm making two and a half million dollars a year in Kansas City the way he was. You know what? I spend a little bit of that money on an interview coach. Yeah. I go spend some time with an executive interview coach. And there are plenty of them out there. They are really good people to work with. I have, I, you know, I know a couple that do it on the side. I would have spent some of my hard-earned money to learn how to interview better if I'm Eric B. Enemy. Just saying. So I, I was not surprised that Biennemi was hired, um, contrary to what Derek said at the beginning, uh, with at least the last two weeks is all we heard is it just sounded like it was. John, you know, I was just busting your balls, brother. No, no, it's all good. But it, I mean, I think I did say that uh, early on because uh, I just couldn't imagine it. Um, I have to wonder, I was surprised by one thing, and that was the assistant coach thing. Because, even, I mean, it, the assistant head coach thing, even even the day before, uh he arrived i was like there's no way i was arguing with somebody on twitter there's no way you got jack del rio who's been a head coach 
uh, forget assistant head coach. He's been a head coach for the Jags and for the Raiders for years and years. I just couldn't imagine that they would t bring in Eric bien who has yet to be a full-time, I'm doing everything offensive coordinator at the NFL level. Not saying he can't, but I just thought that would create such a rift and potentially – cause problems. I didn't think, I didn't think they would do it, but I was, uh, I was t obviously totally wrong. So I would be, I would well, wonder how Del Rio views the whole thing. Not that it matters. It's a done deal. He'll, he'll have to suck it up and smile and say the right things. But I, I was surprised by that. Maybe I'm the only how one. Much, but, well, let's, we would, in saying that we're working on the assumption that Jack Del Rio wants to be a head coach. No, I'm looking at it from the assumption that he doesn't want someone that's essentially his peer elevated above him who hasn't spent a day in Washington and sure. probably got a big, a big uh, bump up in pay as a result of that extra title. He's probably making more than Jack Del Rio is. Ooh. I could be wrong. I'm just, I just no, thought I'm, it was, I, I just thought it was odd that they would do that, but maybe that's what it costs to get Eric B enemy. Somebody on the board said it wasn't uncommon for assistant head coaches to be from the opposite side of the ball that the head coach is. That's, now, you know, they said that, and my first thought was, pretty sure we made Al Saunders the Bodie, head, come here. head coach or the associate head coach or whatever we called him at the time, and he's obviously an offensive guy, and Gibbs is beyond an offensive guy. But, you know, I haven't done any research into that, but it makes a certain level of sense that if you're going to have an assistant head coach, they come from the other side of the ball. I'm not trying to make a thing of it either. Sure. I just – I it just surprised me because it seems like it could – it could create some, eh, a little bit of tension there. But. Now, the other thing is, if I'm Ron Rivera and it looks like it's going to take that to get Eric B. Enemy, I call Jack Del Rio and I say, hey, Jack, I can get Eric B. Enemy, but it's going to take an assistant head coach's oh. title. Are you cool with that? And, and Jack goes, if you can get him and that's what it takes, you do it. Right. I would, yeah, I would hope like hell they were. You know, I mean, let's you almost, you almost wonder if Del Rio wasn't in on some of the meetings. I, I would no. expect him to be in on some of the meetings. The dude had a top five defense this year, and we didn't go to the playoffs because the offense can't score points. <laughs> yeah. How bad does that hurt if you're a defensive head coach, right? You you did your job. Not only do you did you do your job, you did it after your head was on the chopping block the worst yes. the first six weeks of the season. People were ready to get you fired. And all you did was turn it around and become dominant in in a lot of aspects of the game as, as the second half of the season went on. With but, John, I, I, I agree, you, you know, but speaking as a human, you would think that that would, that would be – that would chafe a little bit. But who knows? I mean – Maybe it's all relative, man. He's gotten booted out of two head coaching jobs. So maybe after a while maybe... – <laughs> Maybe he doesn't even want that drama. Maybe he doesn't not. want to deal yeah, with that. Could, it could be, a, it could be a, 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 not a big deal at all. Just I want to say he said that earlier. Somebody asked him about taking a coordinator's position after being a head coach, and he said, <laughs> then they're done that. You know, I want to say I remember him saying that when they first came on here, that it was, I've been there and done that. I'd, I'd like this. No, yeah, that might be the politically correct thing to say, right? If you're an assistant head coach, there are no levels you can achieve that are n not above lateral moves except head coach. That's true. Meaning he can't get promoted away from the team. Right. It's for unless he becomes a head coach. head coach. Somewhere else. Yeah, if he has. Let's say, you know, they, they set any, every NFL scoring record this year. You know, but – no one still wants him as the head coach. He can't leave. Well, he can. We would just have to grant him permission. Yes. Right? Yes, that's what I mean. Yeah. It's, I wonder how much – I'm going to put my tinfoil cap on for a second. And you wonder if there was some outside influence – from a potential buyer to say, get his ass in the building, do whatever it takes. Um, we know that potential buyers reached out to Sean Payton. Sean Payton, though, man. 
<laughs> I'm that's a different hold on a second. The enemy has two rings in the last five seasons, okay? Sean Payton wasn't even in football for the last 48 months. I'm not saying that Sean Payton I know I'm not saying Bianami's on the same level as Sean Payton, but but I I I'm again tinfoil hat. I'm just curious if there was an influence. Because no, don't get me I have zero doubt in my mind that the reason we're rolling with Howell is because Ron Rivera was instructed not to spend any money at the position. I have that I firmly believe that. So I I don't I, I can't rule out in my mind some sort of directive and suggestion, weighted suggestion coming from the powers that be about the direction that anything that they do over the next couple of weeks um, could be influenced by. Now, if an owner had influence over this or a prospective owner, it's, it's Dan Snyder. It, 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 this is a different deal. The, all right. So somebody reaching out a prospective buyer reaching out to Sean Payton is somebody lining up his staff, a prospective buyer calling Ron Rivera and saying, we want Eric Bieniemy in the house is tampering. That is, that is messing around, especially if you don't have at least a handshake deal at that point in time. And, and I think the fact that we've got reports of, of prospective buyers touring the facility as late as Friday tells us that we don't have a handshake deal in place. We probably don't even have any final bids. So, well, hold hey, on. Look, again, I'm putting my hat on. I'm not saying that, that, that I'm definitively buying this, but what if the could a, a potential prospective owner reach out to Snyder and say, our negotiations would go a long way if the enemy was in the building? That's a possibility. But but the idea but the idea that that a the idea that a a prospective owner is going to have any sway with Ron Rivera is is tough from a business perspective very difficult i realize that everybody wants to think that this is different because it's pro sports the reality is it is at that level it is a business okay. and and i i can't see anybody meddling with dan snyder's house prior to at least having an accepted offer on the table for the house itself and i just i just don't I don't see it. I, and I've seen a tremendous amount of speculation that, oh, we hired the enemy because they're the coach. He's the coach in waiting for the next guy. We don't buy that at all. If we knew who the next guy is, maybe, but we don't. And, and here's the thing. When would the enemy have interviewed with the next guy? Dude's been trying to win kind of a big football game for the last four months, <laughs> three months, you know, I, don't I know. think the one, I think the person that's been talking who's been lighting up Ron Rivera's desk phone or his cell phone. It's not an owner. It's Andy Reed. I think Andy Reed's yeah. hands are all over this. He and Rivera go way back. I think a lot of us were nervous because Andy Reed was probably involved because he's, you know, we've gotten jobbed um, times two already. Twice. Uh, but I think, I think they're buds. And I think like, I think he would, I think this was almost like a slam dunk for that reason. I think it's probably been in the works for like a month or more, at least it, theoretically. It, it, and I, I totally agree with you, John. And the reason I agree with you is because he's had the opportunity to let the enemy go for the last two years. Eric has only signed a one-year contract for two years in a row now. And, and all signs in Kansas City pointed to the enemy going right back to Kansas City if he didn't get a job offer he liked that there was a contract waiting for him there to come right back and be offensive coordinator again. Well, if you're really trying to get rid of a guy, it seems to me like he had the perfect out if he wanted it. I think we just got lucky. Circums timing and circumstances, I think we got lucky. Um, Craig Hoffman, who I listened to on 980, he kind of put it really well. He said... It's the crazy thing that all of the things that we kind of bemoan about our franchise, no proven quarterback, bad offense, 
non-playoff team. Those are all things that were appealing to Eric Benemy in a weird kind of a way because it represented something that he can like stamp in his name on, like you talked about earlier. Um, so it's kind of a weird thing that like as bad as we think the offensive situation is, aside from our skill players, you know, it was like a perfect environment for somebody like him to come in because he he probably feels like it's not I don't have to do an overhaul. I just have to I just have to get them all on the same page in the right system with the right plays and or the right guy under center and it and I'm going to look like a genius. So I thought that was a pretty interesting way of looking at it. Well, Bob, you're in the sales business. Uh, if you were a, uh, a sales manager looking at job opportunities, are you more likely to go into a position with a sales staff that has not really been meeting expectations or has been a bit of a disappointment? Or do you want the all-star team that wins every year? <laughs> um. All right. Well, see the all right. So the question there is, or my 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 question in return is, am I am I the sales manager of the of the all star team, and am I the VP of sales of the wannabe team? <laughs> because if I'm getting that stuff up to to the big chair, yeah. I take the big chair. And almost every sales guy I know would make that same decision in in most cases, right? If they want the big chair, they are constantly looking for that next opportunity. And they may pass on some, they may pass on some things because they don't feel like they're completely right, but they don't pass on too many. Because if you pass on too many, word gets around. And then you stop getting those opportunities. Kind of like Eric B. Enemy's not getting interviewed for head coaching. I was gonna say, you wonder how many of those 17 interviews that he was like, no, nah, I'm good. Right. You know, I mean, we don't we don't know whether it was a case of him not getting an offer in every one of those instances or him turning things down. And it's in his best interest to not necessarily tell the world that he turned him down. And let's face it, if you're the bridesmaid who wanted him, are, are you going to tell the world you got jilted? The answer is no. <laughs> so but, it, you know, in the sales world, most of the time, people that want to move up are willing to take a. A less than perfect situation to get an opportunity to prove themselves. And if you're good enough at sales, you can spin that no matter what comes out of it. Right. I mean, you can always spin it. Um, but so, I, which is part of the reason why I felt like the enemy was going to, we had a real shot at him. I didn't, again, like I said, I did not expect us to sign him because we don't get nice things. Um, but, but I always felt like he was in play. And the reason I felt like he was in play was, Guys at that level tend to bet on themselves. They're very big at betting on themselves. How many guys took head coaching positions? What were there, six, seven open head coaching positions in the NFL this year? That position's not open because the guy before you was brilliant. Because the team was amazing. Yeah, because the roster was stacked. Right, exactly. They, they're not walking into perfect situations. It is very rare that a guy like Barry Switzer gets to follow Jimmy Johnson with a team at the prime of their powers and basically moonwalks to a Super Bowl. You get a head coaching position because the team and the guy before you were not cutting it. So or because Jim Mercer is the owner. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, there you go. Feels the need to hire, fire somebody every year and try somebody new. So. You know, and it's kind of the same in the sales world. It's very rare that a VP of sales retires. They get retired in most instances, usually for the same reason a head coach gets retired. Their message is stale. They're not keeping up with things. The The team has gotten complacent. They've you know, lost the locker room. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the verbiage is different, but the reality is the facts are the same. We just call them something else in the sports world. If you're an executive leader, you're an executive leader, whether you're a VP of sales or whether you're a head coach in the NFL. Skill set's a little different, but you're still an exec. In my humble opinion, I guess I should throw that in there. So what are we going to hear on Thursday, gents? Or you know, is this going to be a little, uh, you know, a dog and pony show introducing them? 
what, are we going to hear any news? You think? Um, I think we'll it, hear some stuff on news. You think we will? Some, I mean, not the whole thing, but I, I think that well, we have... we're at least hear about a new wide receiver coach because ours just got hired away today. Yeah. I wondered if that was the reason why they waited till Thursday if they wanted to make some important. staff changes. Yeah. Fair. I, I don't think – I think we're going to hear a lot of word salad. I think there's going to be a couple things in there. I think people are going to ask, you know, are you comfortable with Sam Howell? I think we'll get the coach speak answer. I think it won't mean much because I think – They're going to ask him about the assistant head coach duties. Yeah. Uh, they're going to ask him how does it, how is this different than Kansas City. Um, they're going to ask what, – what's your, gonna, your philosophy going to be? I'm sure it's going to be along the lines of get the ball in the playmaker's hands and let them do their jobs. Um, you know, I, I don't think we're going to hear a ton. Like, but like Chris said, maybe a couple staffing changes, but. Um, I'm excited to hear him speak more than a sound bite. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've never, I've never seen him actually address a room and answer questions. I assume he's going to be able to answer questions. Um I'm I'm interested in that whole dynamic and his verbal skills and his communication abilities and uh, thinking on his feet and that kind of stuff. To your to your point, it is kind of curious that they're waiting almost a week to put him behind the podium. You know, like I'd have trotted his ass out there on Tuesday and said, <laughs> "Hey, you know, or like Monday or Tuesday," and said, "Let's get this thing rolling." On Friday at five o'clock. Yeah. He's in Kansas City right now. Yeah. He I wasn't thought... in Kansas City on Friday. Not on Friday, no. But I mean, my understanding was that he like went back to Kansas City and, and get his family. Yeah, and he and his wife are taking care of stuff in Kansas City. And that, what did I? I read today from somebody on Twitter, I think, and it was and it wasn't you know John Q. Public. It was it was a reporter, uh, Ben Standig maybe or Kime or Finley. I can't remember which one of them. But that their understanding was that when the enemy came back to Washington, the end of this week, he was Stand. in Washington. He was here right. permanently that there was going to be no back and forth, that he'd gone back to Kansas City to close out business there, and that when he got here at the end of the week, he was here. going to be a lot of fun. Fair, Fair but but I, I don't – this is 2023, brother. We can put somebody on a plane and have them here for 90 minutes and have them on another plane going the other direction if you wanted to. No, that's – that, and that's fair. Um, So – before we get, we're getting close to wrap up time, but I wanted to throw it out there. What do you, what do you guys think? What do you, if you were Eric Bien, I mean, what, what are you looking at in terms of position groups? What do you think he does in terms of, we got free agency coming up the draft. What do you think he's campaigning for the most, or what do you think he's most looking to upgrade on, on this roster? Interior line. I think it starts on the interior. Everybody's screaming for tackles. I think the interior was the leak. I think where you start from the middle and you work yourself out. Charles Leno is a serviceable tackle. He's been a serviceable tackle in the in, in the league. So much so, we just gave him an extension. Cosme came out of college. Everybody, he was trending in the right direction. Now everybody's speculating he moves inside. I think he's looking at those two guard positions in the center position and saying, I can't have a guy who's out of the league, out who's on the tape, the training table 60% of the year. And I can't have two guards getting paid a combined eighteen million dollars or whatever it was, getting nothing. I need at least a guard, and I need a starting center stat. 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 I think. I, I think the other obvious answer over over and above the interior offensive line might be the tight end position. Uh, when you think of position groups that have that were probably amongst the most disappointing for our team last year. It, the tight end group would be right near the top of that list. Um, and you think of who we have at quarterback, we're going to be trotting Sam Howell out there. And, you know, your tight end is often your safety blanket for your quarterback. And we certainly need to give him uh, that type of safety blanket that, you know, the likes of Travis Kelsey uh, provided over the years. Now, I know that's probably not a great example because he's the best tight end in football. But when mm -hmm. you think of, uh, the dependence that Kansas City had on a tight end position. I can't see him walking in here, uh, the enemy that is, and, you know, functioning an offense without uh, a capable tight end. So I think that would be uh, right near the top of our priority list. 
uh, in terms of offensive needs as well for BNM to be successful. We got to have a backup quarterback or competition, if you want to call it that. I want. I wish they would go ahead and release once, man. I don't know when the deadline for that is, but it makes me nervous. I don't, every day, every I don't day he's in the roster, and yeah. I don't want. I don't want BNM to have to say nice things about once. Nothing against once. He's a fine man, but for God's sake, don't put him back out there in burgundy and gold, please, <laughs> if if possible. I don't want to see it. I, you know, I've watched everybody on everybody on Twitter go crazy over tight end prospects. I mean, to the point where we're, we're ignoring offensive line prospects. In fact, I have seen a ridiculous amount of chatter about spending the 16th pick in the draft on a tight end this year. I don't see that happening. Uh, I, I really, I really don't. Uh, if we don't want to tackle, I see us trading back uh, to stockpile more picks, if at all possible, much like we did last year uh, to take a, you know, a guard or a center. I don't know if I don't know if we spend that much capital on a tight end this year. I'm not I'm I haven't done a lot of work looking at the draft. There aren't going to be a lot of tight ends available. And I mean, let's face it, tight ends at this point in time, class tight ends are not in abundance in the NFL. Well, we got there's some pretty good tight ends in the free agency. Program. I want Gesicki. So I think if they go that route. If they look at Cole Turner and some of the other guys we have and decide that, that they don't fit the bill, you know, I could see us doing it in free agency. But, you know, I just I don't I, I look at our receiving core and something else I go back to out of that article about what we can expect from Eric the enemy. And the, and the final thing in that article about it, what we can expect from Eric the enemy was you can expect Eric the enemy to build an offense around the talent he has, not try and squeeze the talent we have into the offense he wants to run. They created an offense that works for Travis Kelsey because the dude is probably the, you know, in the last 20 years, he's probably the best tight end to play the game, except maybe Gronkowski, right? He and Gronk are right there and they kind of fight over the position of who was best for the last 15, 20 years, I guess. That's, he's generational talent. We're not going to see that. We aren't going to see that. And I think Eric B enemy comes in and goes, look at the wide receiving core. I have, I need a blocking tight end. I need a guy that can put a defensive end on his ass. I don't need a guy that can catch the football. <laughs> Just my thought. Well, I, I, I do pose the question and not to rebut you, Paul, because I do agree that we do need an upgrade at tight end, but the question, though, is it, did did Eric Bieniemy tailor his offense to be a tight end offense because that's what he's comfortable with, or because he inherited Travis Kelsey? Um, kind of to that point. If you have Travis Kelsey, you start to change your offense to get that guy's ball hand, you know, get the ball in that guy's hand with a uh, with regularity. But I think Logan Thomas is overpaid. To your point, um, I think I think Logan Thomas ultimately pro either has some sort of a renaissance, which I'm not seeing, or he gets released because I just don't think he's 100. percent And I don't think they go into the season with Cole Turner and John Bates and Armani Rogers battling it out to be starting tight ends, uh, especially with the money we're going to have knowing that you don't need to spend it on quarterback, knowing you don't need to spend it on a premium position right now. Um, so I, I think they could tap a tight end in free agency that might be a little more expensive than you want to spend, but to bolster that, somebody who's a two-way tight end. Well, what is, uh, what's Hal's salary this coming year? 875, something like that? About a million. A million? About a million. Um, a lot of reports today that uh, Jalen Hurts is looking for 50 mil a year and Daniel Jones is looking for 45 mil a year. Yep. Gee, wouldn't a million a year be pretty nice if he's good, if he can play the position? You know, I don't – this is a completely different discussion that we should probably have at some time with something to think about. I, if I'm a starting quarterback in the NFL, I don't know that I want 45 or 50 million a year because I see what it's done to the rosters of the guys that have gotten that money. You're assuming that winning is the most important thing. 
Oh, I, I agree with you a hundred percent, Bob. I, I, yeah, I mean, I agree with you that it should, it should be. A you're thing. assuming that winning <laughs> is the most important thing. Derek, twenty-five million a year is generational money, just as much as fifty million a year is generational money. Then why is Lamar Jackson, who's in a perennial Super Bowl contending team, looking to match the Deshaun Watson contract? I think that's as much ego as it is anything else. You're assuming that winning is the most important thing. And you know, you're you're right, but you know it's not going to change man it's not going to change it's not it's not and we need to get that collusion thing going with the cut with the owners man that's what we need stop paying this insane money you know it's not going to change and here's one of those weird things i had the thought the other day i wonder how long it's going to be before the quarterback doesn't count under the salary cap or they or it's a percentage i don't don't understand why that's not just a reasonable thing is you can only spend this percentage of the salary cap on the, I can. I t- I'll, I'll tell NFL, you. I'll tell you why the NFL, NFL doesn't want to do that. I, I, I'll tell you why the NFL doesn't want to do that because if you start setting the baseline, then thirty-two players are going to be going for that baseline, even if they're not val- worthy of it. Yeah, you'll you'll have Taylor Heineke making as much money as Tom Brady. Correct, because that his agent is going to say you've got sixteen percent carved out of your your salary cap for the quarterback position. I want all of it, or we don't play. You know, I just, I don't, I don't understand. There is no Hall of Fame for who made the most money. There's no Hall of Fame for that. Not yet. (laughs) I I, did well, but I I don't know. Maybe Canton adds a new week, John. Kirk Cousins is a first ballot Hall of Famer into that (laughs) camp. But if, if, if I'm a player (laughs) and I look at Canton and I see the guys who are in there and I look at Tom Brady and I know Brady is, you know, Brady's a first ballot guy and, and he's got seven and I want, if I'm Pat Mahomes and I'm looking at Brady and I'm thinking, I want seven rings, I want to beat Brady. My first thought is I can't beat Brady making 20% of the salary cap of my team. There but, has hold to on, be but money to spread around. To that point, Pat Mahomes got 20% of the salary cap for the first two years of his, what, 10-year contract? I know. I know. I And I didn't understand it when it happened. But, I mean, right. I, I, but maybe I just think differently. I don't know. Brady was probably also the only NFL quarterback ever to make less money than his wife for damn sure i'm not trying to look bob i look, the romance is there i'm not trying to debunk I your know. theory i, I would agree that quarterbacks who have the priority is to win need to evaluate their salary against the cap the percentage but agents don't think that way you know who else doesn't think that way the nfl pa doesn't think that way i guarantee you the nfl pa is like no you need to go get your bag because at the time you get a bag, the next guy's bag gets bigger. And then the guy after that's bag gets bigger. And then you get the guy after that's bag gets bigger. Oh, and I it's, know. It's perpetual because then yeah. they, they tell them it's us versus them. It's the players need to be – the players need to beat the owners because they're billionaires. They have the money. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think it's ever going to be that way despite the fact that the the – you know the, the 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 template appears to be there. It, it it appears that if the quarterback takes less money, the rest of the salary cap can go to the, and you can pay the rest of the team to be better, creating a better situation. Well, and but, you can make the argument that this Super Bowl result supports that, right? The Eagles. The Eagles were pretty much recognized as having the most solid roster in the NFL, top to bottom, and a big part because, of that because Jalen, Jalen Hurts, Hurts was on a rookie, on a rookie, contract. rookie deal, right. you know. And and Pat Mahomes had a less talented roster because Pat Mahomes is on a I don't know what ten year four hundred and fifty million dollar deal or whatever it is, right? But then Pat Mahomes just went all Pat Mahomes. And then on the Super- Pat Mahomes exactly. Pat Mahomes went Mahomes on the Eagles and won the game. And, and, and everybody watching that game knows who won it. Yeah. And, and so the argument is, if you're paying Pat Mahomes, that's great. If you and have if Pat you're Mahomes. you're not paying Pat Mahomes. <laughs> the Eagles would love to have Pat Mahomes right now. <laughs> yeah. To Chris's point, who would have ever thought Daniel Jones would be commanding $45 million? 
on the back of basically one good year. Oh, gee, sounds like Deron Payne. Washington should get a vig off that contract. <laughs> <laughs> wow. right, I think that may be the quote of the night, Chris. <laughs> I think we've totally flushed out that tangent on the NFL quarterback salaries, but sorry. yeah, didn't mean to go there, but you know, it right. just... <sighs> I think we're way too early in the game to do predictions on Eric Bianami. Unlike ESPN, who literally had their scroller today with Stephen A. Smith saying, "Did the enemy make a mistake?" <laughs> yeah. Um, it is but... interesting the, the local reaction, even you know, among the writers and the radio it's... people and whatever, other than Chris Russell. The local opinion has been very positive, and the national opinion has been kind of very negative. Yeah, I think a lot of people still, until Snyder's out of here like well out of here, like a year out of here, we're we're not going to be able to get the stank off of us. I mean, people still talk about like, you know, we're spending a gazillion dollars in free agency trying to buy a championship. Well, that was like yeah. 15 years ago, but you still hear that crap. So I think it's going to take a while. Uh, and I think that's why you see the difference between the local guys who kind of know what the hell's going on versus the national people that just parrot whatever they've heard over the years. So. Yeah, I think it's been pretty positive. I've, I'm, you were talking about like home run and that kind of language, hit it out of the park. That I've seen a lot of the media guys using that, the local media guys using that kind of language. Well, it was a home run. Nobody expected him to come here. He came here. The guy's got the pedigree that we've never seen in this. Going back to Gibbs, we've never brought in a coach that has been coaching on any level in the Super Bowl two out of the last five seasons. Take that for what it's worth. I don't care what anybody says. Even we we hired John Gruden who or Jay Gruden who was supposed to be the next up and coming guy based on the merit that he had coached with Marvin Lewis and that team was decent to to okay to a little bit better than okay for a long time. I meant that primarily uh specifically for Rivera and for Bianca. Uh you know, for Rivera, the hiring pulls his ass out of the fire for the most part. If if the enemy performs and keeps him employed, perhaps for another season, uh, at a minimum, uh, and for the enemy, it's a home run because if he does come in and perform, maybe he gets to be a head coach next year. It's a it's a win win. It's right. Hey, any change is good change at this point. I think. I mean, to a certain extent, that's where I'm at. Like, and I and you guys know I wasn't as hard on Scott Turner as some fans were, but. I, I mean, I, you know, wanted to, I wanted to see him succeed and I probably hung in there longer than I should have on his behalf. But I mean, let's face it. He's got to be better than Scott Turner. He's got to be, he's got to have some, bring some positive things to the offense that we haven't seen in a while. So I'm excited about it. And it starts on Thursday. <laughs> I guess we'll find out a little bit more on Thursday morning. 11 a.m. All right, boys. I think we all uh, we're all somewhat expected, ex, um, excited, but I think we have cautious optimism here going forward. Uh, I don't know. That's about where I stand on it. So hopefully, hopefully we can uh, you know get beyond just living in hope in the off season, and we can see some results on the field come uh, September, October, and November. Amen. Thanks, guys. All right, gents. It's been a pleasure. And uh, we'll be back in a couple of weeks, I assume.